Hello, everyone. So welcome to the second day of TPC and DigiPro 2021. Um, this is a TPC talk. My name is Alexis Casas, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this pipeline outside media and entertainment session. Over the past three years at TPC, we've been trying to bridge and get inspired by pipelines out of the animation and visual effects world. And this is why today, um, Harvest Zhang and Anastasio Garcia Rodriguez from Airbus are joining us to present their talk and title, Airbus and the Data-Driven Pipeline. This talk will be recorded and will be available to view on Whova later today uh, after the end of the day. Harvest Zhang leads Wayfinder's perception team at Acubed, Airbus Innovation Center located in the heart of Silicon Valley. The perception team is responsible for the end-to-end -end system that takes input from multispectral cameras and inertial sensors and outputs navigation data to the aircraft. This work includes developing scalable pipelines for real data ground truth label generation, inference architectures, integrating computer vision, deep learning, and sensor fusion algorithms, and open and closed loop systems testing in simulation. Anastasio Garcia leads Wayfinder simulation team at Acubed, Airbus Innovation Center in the Valley. In this capacity, Anastasio is responsible for the design and development of Wayfinder's uh, simulation framework, which facilitates the creation of photorealistic imagery and associated metadata to be fed to a deep learning pipeline. Prior to this current role, uh, Tasio held different positions at NVIDIA, Disney Research, Sony Pictures, Imageworks, and Weta Digital, among other companies, where he used his simulation and 3D computer graphic skills to develop a variety of projects in the areas of robotics, AI for cloth and sphere simulation, and automatic speech animation, fluid simulation, and visual effects software for film production. So please uh, welcome Anastasio and Harvest. Anastasio, I think you can start. So thank you, thank you, Alexis. I'm trying to share my uh, screen with the presentation. Give me, give me a second. And we're good, we can see it. Just I guess. full screen. Can you guys see, see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Can see it. Just make it full screen. Yes, all good. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so thank you, Alexi, for the introductions and welcome everybody to our talk. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, our talk today is, is creating a data driven pipeline at Airbus, um, developing solutions for autonomous commercial aircraft. Uh, a bit um, overview of the agenda we are going to follow today. First, we are going to explain who we are, what we're trying to do, uh, follow by a uh, brief overview uh, of the pipeline that we're working on. Then I'm going to present the real data pipeline, and Harvest is going to present the work we're doing with the, for the real data pipeline. And at the end, we have our little Q&A. So as Alexis uh, mentioned, I'm Anastasio Garcia. I'm leading the simulation team here at um, Acube and Wayfinder. Um, I'm here today with my colleague, Harvey Sand, who is leading the perception team. We both work at uh, Acube. Uh, Acube is, uh, was founded in 2015, uh, and it's the innovation center of Airbus in Silicon Valley. The, the goal of AQ is to help you the future of the industry um, by pursuing high value, high impact innovation projects. In, in other words, we are trying to work on projects that have the potential to change the way we fly and the way we travel by air. Uh, Wayfinder is one of the teams in AQ. AQ is divided in different teams. Work, each team is working in different technologies. And in particular, Wayfinder, our mission is to develop autonomous flight and machine learning solutions for the next generation of aircraft. Um, a bit of overview, overview of the talk today. Uh, we're going to present, let me just quickly put my timer on so I know over time. Yeah, so we are presenting a, a data driven pipeline for the development of autonomous flying vehicles. Um, where pipeline is a bit different from the traditional VFX or computer animation shop uh, pipeline. 
uh, for us, data is the king uh, because we are working with machine learning algorithms with AI and deep learning. Uh, we need large amount of data and it has to be quality data. Uh, we need this data for our supervised learning techniques uh, and we need both. We, know, we need the raw data, something we can capture with a real camera, as well as accurate ground through labels that can be provided with synthetic data. For the synthetic data pipeline, you, you will see there are some common elements uh, found in VFX or computer animation pipelines. Uh, we use many techniques in common in 3D computer graphics and particularly in real time rendering. One big difference for us is that we don't have any 3D artists. We don't have any artist art department. We, we, we don't have people doing models. We don't have people doing the illumination or applying shaders. Uh, we, we don't do any kind of uh, manually generated 3D content. Every, everything for us has to be uh, automatically created. And, and the reason for this is uh, that we need to think of bigger scale. Um, we are talking about many, many uh, thousands of, of images and the associated metadata. So we, we cannot consider a manual, um, a manual uh, assets. I just, I'm being told that my video was off. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm, now you can see my face. Uh, yeah, and the, the real data pipeline, um, so we have the synthetic data pipeline, but we also have the real data pipeline, which is the, the pipeline we use to, to capture uh, real images. Um, we, because we are working in an aerospace environment, we have a pretty specialized camera rig that you will see in, in the next slides. Um, for some, one difference between synthetic data and real data, for synthetic data, it's kind of easy to, to get the labels for the images, and I will talk about the label, labels a bit later. But for the real data pipeline, actually labeling the features that we're interested in is, is actually a, a significant challenge. And Harvey will explain a bit more about this. And what we have is a hybrid pipeline. Um, and by hybrid, I mean, for example, in, in a film pipeline, you have a real data. I mean, you have real images you, that you you record the actors doing their part, and then we had the VFX uh, people doing the synthetic images, the renderings. And at some point, we mix all these images together. We we take uh, real data, uh, real uh, shoot footage, and on top of that footage, we we put uh, props with uh, 3D assets. We we add the special effects. We do color grading. Uh, so, but the, the idea here is that for a film pipeline, we mix these two sources of images. And, and the end product is a final image with everything in there. Uh, for us, the, the pipeline is a bit different. Uh, we don't mix the real data and the synthetic data. We keep these two parallel pipelines. And for us, the, the output of this pipeline is not even an image. Uh, for us, the, the real output of our pipeline is, um, is a neural network model. So let's dive in into the synthetic data pipeline. As you can imagine, because we are dealing with aerospace environments, uh, all, all of, I would say, 100% of our environments are outdoor environments. So we have to make some consideration in terms of outdoor environments and how we are going to light these environments. We have to deal with large scale outdoor scenarios. Uh, the planes move fast, so when an when a aircraft is, is flying, you can cover a lot of terrain. We need realistic terrain rendering. And we get this terrain, this terrain data from either DMA files that they are publicly available or for high, high maps. For us, it's very important to very realistic render airports and runways and all the runways with runway markings. So runways and airports, they, they are kind of um, interesting city environment because airports in general, they, they, everything is, is standardized. Uh, you, you expect to have the same signs in all airports in the world. Uh, the, the, the layout of the runways have to conform to some kind of uh, specifications. So in, in a way, it's an easy environment because this, everything is very standardized. But at the same time, there are cases that some runways and airports don't follow this standard for whatever reason, for technical reasons. And we have to, to be able to handle both cases. Uh, when the airport is something that is a standard, as well as airport is, is not a standard at all. Uh, a sky rendering, as you can imagine, sky rendering is very important for us. It has to be realistic. So that's why we use a uh, physically based sky rendering. I'm going to talk briefly about this. Um, for the same reason, we need accurate sun position when we need to do time of day simulations. So we, we want to see the sun in the camera field of view in the, in the position it should be to match the a real world image. 
Uh, and again, I mentioned again, scalability issues. Uh, we are talking about large scale uh, images, amount of data, and we need automated solutions. And one, one way for us to have these automated solutions is to try to proceed to create uh, cities and airports. Uh, for terrain rendering, uh, as you can see in these uh, uh, images, we need different terrain scale depending on the application that we are working on and the phase of flight. For example, you can see on the on the image to the left, uh, this is an approach to land. In the, in this case, the airport is about six kilometers from the from the runway, and in this particular case, because the airport the the aircraft is far from the runway, you can see a large amount of terrain, and you can also see quite a bit of the city surrounding the, the airport. Then in the middle image, we had a, a middle case. Um, the, the aircraft is kind of, it's not, it's about maybe, I don't know, from one kilometer to touch one point. And then you, you, you start to see more of the airport and less of the city and less of the terrain around the airport. And on the right image, that's the same case when we're about to land. In, in this case, you see you see less of the terrain in the background, uh, we, we, which is shift the focus to, to the runway itself, and and that's when we need very high detail uh, renderings of the runways and the airports. So we, we we go from bigger scale, see, seeing a lot of, of terrain, to a small scale terrain terrain very close to to the runways. For for a sky rendering. Uh, Basically, we use a standard computer graphics models that, that, that have been published in SIGGRAPH and different uh, conferences. Uh, I think we have done that have been quite a bit uh, good models out there, and those, those are the kind of models that we use. Nothing, I mean, pretty standard there. Uh, for us, as I mentioned before, many times for film, in, for film or maybe video games, you know, because the sun is far away, you can approximate the sun illumination with that uh, uh, directional light that will be up. But for us, we, we need actually the, the accurate position of the sun. Uh, and this is also we can represent how the sun is viewed with respect to one particular runway. Uh, runways, you notice runways have a number, and, and the runways are actually oriented uh, with respect to some heading. Um, so for example, that means if we are landing, let's say we are landing uh, runway 9, that 9 means that the runway is facing east. So if we land on that runway during sunset, we should be being seeing the sun in the, in the camera field of view when we land on that runway. That's, for us, that's why for us it's important to position the, 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 the sun accurately on the sky. Also important for us is weather simulations and we need different type of cloud types and different weather environments from, from sunny, clear days to very stormy, foggy conditions. So we have to handle all these kind of considerations. I'm not going to go into the, in, into cloud rendering, for example, but just to mention that uh, many times we can cheat. We can use uh, uh, B-Boards techniques to, to render in clouds uh, because the cloud is mostly like a decoration. It's something that's just in the background. But some of the times we need to do volumetric rendering of clouds, uh, particularly if you want to, to fly through the clouds. But I, I, I won't go into this kind of details today. Then, for, so we have to, to handle daytime and nighttime. Uh, for nighttime, what is very important for us, for us is all the illumination that you can find in a rear runway. Uh, this, this light, there are different types with different sizes, different colors, and we need to represent this with precision. Um, yeah. This is an example of, uh, this is a screenshot of the, one of the, uh, of the uh, plane simulator that we use. And this is a very representative image of the kind of cases that we have to deal with. Uh, so you can see in this case, this is actually an approach to land in San Francisco International Airport, uh, close to sunset. Uh, so you can see in the background quite a bit of terrain um, and quite a bit of uh, sky rendering going on. And also you can see on the wrong way how the lights are already on because of the time of the day. Uh, you can see all the runways uh, uh, lights at the edge of the runways you can see the particular the, the lights in the center line of the runway. You can see the the blue uh, taxi lines, uh, lights that define the taxi lines. And very important for us in this case, you can also see very, very dim in, at the beginning, almost in the water, the, the approach light system for this particular uh, runway. And, and again, in, in this case, uh, it's very important to have the sun in the right uh, position. Uh, that, that's what I if we were flying this approach in real life, 
we will see we will expect to see something similar to this uh, rendering I apologize in advance for the quality of the video uh, there might be some lag uh, I just want to play so th this video is um, uh, landing to the same um, airport San Francisco airport uh, this time is landing in round with 28 right and what is interesting about this video the, the flight path is exactly the same for all these different animations the only thing we are changing here is the the weather simulation the different weather environments so we go from from very clear daylight cloud day to something stormy, something sunset. So, but but again, the, the flight path is exactly the same. The, the only difference here is the the weather environment. And sometimes we need to simulate rain as well. Um, and, and that's important to to mostly to to have a huge variety of data and data that is representative of real world conditions. Then, in terms of um, how to create environments in a procedural manner, we try something that I wanted to show here. Uh, full, full disclaimer, this is not something that we are using at the moment. This is a test we did, but I, I think it was partly successful. But I think it's important also to share uh, things that uh, somehow didn't, didn't work 100% for us. So in this case, we use, we, the, the idea was to use Houdini to try to create big environment cities uh, procedurally. So we started on, on the left image, you can see we import into Houdini some geospatial data. Um, if I remember correctly, this is coming from OpenScript maps. Um, what we, you see on the left image is all the, the, the city layout with the, the roads, the, all the buildings, offices. You can even see the Palo Alto airport close to the center of the image and all the surrounding uh, um, city environment. On the left, on the sorry, on the right image, is it, the same. Is the same area, it's the same area. But this time, what we capture here is the photograph uh, from a satellite covering the same, the same image. This is something you can get from Bing or Google, Google Maps, uh, Google Earth. Uh, it, so the idea here was to use these two sources of information, combine them, and to get something like this. So something that like you can see here. The idea is to get a full city, almost automatically in a very automatic process. So we 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 Houdini, you can take the this open street map data and Houdini is going to extract the 3d buildings based on the geospatial information on the on the gis data and we use the satellite image basically has a texture map to cover the terrain to create some um, fidelity of the real world terrain so it did it did work really well in in some cases i mean you can get a big city very quickly and very cheaply uh, you can get the right shape of the buildings on the with the right size and the right locations the same the same with the roads you you, you get the proper layout of the roads the, the problem for us is that the this this automatic process didn't provide any way to create for example text to match for the building so the, all the buildings they are like a 3d blocks the, there is no detail there and it, even even though we saw it, it was pretty easy and fast to do this it's still a manual process so and, and we had to to manually um, adjust the region of interest and to make sure that the satellite images is a perfect match to the open stream map uh, data. So it's still a, a bit of a manual process. So it, it, it's something that we did try, but it, it's not going to scale for, for our needs, or, or at least not with the pipeline that we look into uh, when we did this experiment. Uh, I, I should mention that actually creating, uh, creating environments and big cities environments is still an area of research for us. So diving in, in the simulation environment, um, that's where you're going to see many um, similarities and differences with a traditional pipeline, uh, VFX pipeline animation kind of um, environments. Uh, for us, uh, everything is real-time rendering. Uh, we use either OpenGL, Vulkan, or nowadays we are starting to use Unreal Engine as well. We don't have uh, offline rendering. We don't, we don't have a render farm to, to do our renderings. Everything is GPU-based. Uh, you can imagine dealing with aircraft and aerospace, we need a, a very accurate physics engine to deal with all the flight dynamic. Um, we can do this in two different ways. We can use off the shelf flight simulator. That's going to do the, all the flight simulation for us, all the flight dynamics and components for us. 
we can also use uh, a standalone uh, flight dynamics um, numerical code that basically based on the position of the aircraft and the velocity acceleration is going to calculate all the dynamics for the of the aircraft for you. Something that is, is new that you don't find in a VFX uh, computer animation pipeline is the need to use some particular reference frames. So reference frame for us is very important. And people working in robotics, they're going to recognize this immediately. So a, a reference frame is basically the same idea as having a, a transform in, in a package like a Maya Houdini. So you have your transform. And with this transform, you can translate, rotate, or scale your objects. Uh, we, we, we do something similar uh, and explain in, in a couple of slides. One difference that we don't deal with uh, 3D transform change in the sense that that's something you were using for cars animation, skeleton animation, inverse kinematics. We, we, we don't have to deal with this case. That's something we don't have to worry about. But what is very important for us is the ability to convert from one reference frame to another. And, and we do this all the time. This is very important for us, which is something that in Maya, for example, you have your 3D world. Um, you have one 3D world, and you don't convert from 3D world to another 3D world in Maya. It's, it's, it's always the same. And in aeronautics, we have some uh, standard reference frames that, that we use, and I'm going to explain a few of those in, in a couple of slides. Another thing that is new uh, in this pipeline, I mean, when I say new uh, compared to our traditional computer graphics pipeline, is that we need to use labels. Um, and more specifically, we need a way to automatically label uh, the features that we're interested in. Uh, these labels is what we're going to use. The labels and the associated meta metadata is what we're going to use to train our neural networks. And we use the synthetic image, the synthetic data, to provide the ground through labels. So the idea is to use computer graphics techniques to render a synthetic world that approximate the real world. And as I mentioned before, one of the advantages of using synthetic data is that you can get the ground through labels quite easily. So now I'm going to, in the next three slides, I'm going to go a bit more uh, deep detail. Um, this is basically the core of what we do. As I mentioned, in, in I, I like, for example, um, I like in Maya or Houdini, we don't have a 3D Cartesian world, right? In Maya Houdini, you have your 3D world. Um, is everything's given with respect to the 3D world, and you can everything is, is living in a flat world. Um, but for us, we, we, because we have to deal with a real world environment, we have to take into account the curvature of Earth, um, and that's where we use this uh, Earth center, Earth fixed frame. This is very common in aeronautics and aerospace. Th this frame is is very useful to calculate orientations and directions for aircraft with with global movements. That means that this frame is going to work anywhere. On, on, on this uh, on Earth, uh, you can see on the figures this reference frame is is fixed to the to Earth and rotates with Earth, so we don't have to work and we don't have to worry about uh, effects due to uh, Earth rotation. That that would be the case if we are dealing with uh, calculating flight uh, trajectory for satellite images something like that. But because we are just flying airplanes, we don't worry about the rotation of Earth. So that's why we can use this this uh, reference frame. This is a right-handed reference frame uh, with origin at the center of Earth. Um, you can use this reference frame. You can use two different coordinate systems in this reference frame. You can use a geodetic coordinate system with everything's latitude, longitude, and altitude. You, you can think of this geodet geodetic coordinates is almost like it's basically like a polar coordinates that you can use in a sphere or cylinder, right? Uh, it's a polar coordinates where you have two angles, and for us also a part of and on top of these two angles, we also need the altitude. You can, use, you can also use a, a more common a Cartesian coordinates given by X, Y, and Z on this frame. It's very common when um, the X, Y, and Z Cartesian coordinates is, is an easy way to do simulations and to share data with all, all the simulators. But for, from a human point of view, uh, it's easier to use LLA, right? It's, it's like using a GPS. You use a GPS, and GPS is going to give you the coordinates in latitude, longitude, and altitude. Um, also, this frame allow, allow us to abstract the, the shape of, of the Earth. And, and given that uh, a, a shape, a, a model of how round or how not round is the Earth, we, we, can, we can convert back and forth between LLA and S1Z. 
I'm, I'm thinking I'm running a bit of, out of time, so I'm trying to go fast. This is the uh, NAD, North East Down, is a very common reference frame as well in aeronautics. Uh, it's, it's a way this uh, allows us to put to position this frame in any object in, around this sphere. Um, sorry, I, I had to go, move a bit faster now. And you can use the NAD, NAD frame. It's very easy to to construct this NAD, NAD frame from any position on this globe. Um, you can see basically you 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 build your uh, initial NAD frame on the ECF frame. And given this vector, so it's very easy to see that the the north, the end of the NAD frame will be the vector zero zero one. You can see this in this um, image. The east vector correspond to the y axis, so it's zero one zero, and the down vector is just the minus x vector and the easy frame, so it's minus minus one zero zero. And you apply two rotations, and by applying two rotations, you can put this origin uh, this uh, zero and N0, D0, E0 frame. By applying two consecutive rotations, you can put this frame anywhere, any point in, in this globe. Another important reference frame is the aircraft's reference frame. We use this all the time. This is fundamental for us. It's the same idea, like in, in Maya, you have your object, and if you change the pivot point of your object, you're going to change how the transformer is going to be applied to, to this object. This, the same idea for us, the only thing is that Will be the pivot point for us is the central gravity of the aircraft, the point G on this on this image. And then, in, in, for example, in Maya, you can 3D rotate an object, right, in any 3D uh, direction. We, we have some special uh, rota name for these rotations. We use roll, pitch, and yaw, and, that, and that's how a real plane actually orientates in a 3D space. Uh, this is just a quick image of um, an aircraft reference frame. Is shown here uh, has a solid line. You can also see the the local NAD frame has a dotted line, and, and and this is we use this all the time. This two frame we use this all the time. Um, for example, if you have the if you have the the raw pitch and yaw, you can use that information to 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 change from one frame to out to another. Or if you don't you don't have the raw pitch and yaw and you have the frames. You can measure the relative uh, orientation of one frame with respect to another to get the raw pitch and job. And, and we use this all the time to to do uh, our labeling work, which is what we need to discuss right now. So, automatic labeling of runway features is, uh, together with the reference frames, is the another key component of uh, synthetic data pipeline. If I ask you to, to tell me what is the runway. I mean, this is going to be very easy for you. Everybody can see what the runway is just by looking at the image. And, and the same way, if if we add where is the center line, or, or where is the threshold mark, or where the aiming points, we be, a human can visually detect all these features very quickly. The, the problem is how how do we tell a computer where these features are? Uh, even more, how do we teach a computer to to take a look at this image? and understand where the runway is or where the center line is or where the aiming point is. That's where we need labels. Uh, and this is a bit different with computer graphics. Uh, labels for us is just a, a, a set of coordinates of a given feature, a given in a reference frame. For example, the, the, label, the labels for the runway uh, outline could be the four corner points of the runway. So in this set slide, you can see on the, on the left image, that's a direct screenshot from the flight simulator. Uh, this is an approach to Monterey Airport. Um, and you can, you can, I mean, any human could see the, the runway right, right there in the center of the screen. So in the in the image in the in the center, you can see the outline on the runway has a cyan color, and you can see the runway center line. Those are the labels that we, we need that we need to inform the neural network so the neural network can learn how to detect the, run, the runways. But we don't give, we don't pass this label has this has this image to the neural network training process. What we what we feed the neural network is these numbers that you see on the right image. Uh, these numbers correspond to the the four corners of the runway, so it defines the runway outline or the bounding box. And also we have the labels for the center line, uh, which is two points. Uh, center line, I mean the, the the point close to the camera and the point far away from the camera. And we are giving these labels in two different reference frames. One is the LLA reference frame that I mentioned before, the same coordinates that you will get with a GPS. 
and we also provide these labels in the screen space or pixel space. Um, I think I'm going to hand it over to Harvest so he can explain the real data pipeline. Yeah, thanks, Dozio. So now that you've all seen what we do in uh, simulation to generate synthetic data, the idea here is let's look at uh, what we do to collect real data, which of course is a little bit less of a VFX pipeline and more the, uh, the real side of things, but we'll see what that analog is. So we call our, uh, what you would consider a camera rig in, uh, in the film industry, maybe the onboard wayfinder laboratory or OWL for short. Uh, that's our aircraft. It's instrumented with an array of sensors for data acquisition. Uh, it contains cameras. So for now that's visible spectrum only, uh, but we are going multispectral in the process of going multispectral. Um, it contains an INS GNSS that stands for an inertial navigation system and a global navigation satellite system. So as you might expect, GPS. Uh, and we also have differential GPS headings. So this is similar to um, the, the uh, inertial measurement unit, the gyroscope and accelerometer in your phone, uh, except it has sort of uh, better dead reckoning, better precision, and is able to uh, determine the position and orientation of the aircraft in space. It turns out that magnetic heading is not a very accurate thing, right? It gets you maybe a couple degrees worth of precision. And so what we do is we actually have two uh, GPS antennas, and we uh, are able to determine the heading by using the signal um, difference between two GPS antennas that are longitudinally oriented on the aircraft. So that helps us get to uh, significantly sub-degree heading accuracy. And finally, of course, we have a flight computer to synchronize and record all the data from the different sensors. The time synchronization piece is important there, especially to us. Uh, because in post-production, we need to uh, take that, take that uh, imagery and synchronize it to the INS so we know for each frame exactly where that camera was pointed and where it was in space. So the data labeling pipeline is, uh, is two things. One is fairly simple, and that's bringing the data from the aircraft to, to the data center. Um, as it turns out, in terms of bandwidth, uh, just taking SSDs out of the airplane and driving them physically over to our, our, uh, our data ingestion point is the most bandwidth efficient way to do this. Uh, and then the harder part, which is uh, easier in simulation because you know everything about the environment, is taking that raw sensor data and turning it into pixel labeled data sets. So as Tazio showed in, in previous slides uh, for training the deep CNNs. Let's go ahead and take a look at our camera rig. So this is our Beechcraft uh, 58 Baron aircraft. Uh, you can see in the upper left and the lower left, the camera rig that we currently have with, uh, with reference to the cockpit. You'll notice that it's inside of the aircraft. Um, this is obviously not ideal for image quality and especially for going multispectral. Uh, the reason we did this is internally mounted cameras enable simpler hardware integration for initial flight data collection. Uh, if it turns out if you want to, you know, mount things on the outside of an aircraft or you want to modify uh, any sort of physical piece of the aircraft in a significant way, that requires more certification work and so on. And it was much easier to get started inside the aircraft. However, this does introduce optical challenges and we'll talk about uh, how we address those in the next slide. So there's a few issues with uh, uh, mounting the camera rig on the inside, primarily to do with the fact that you have the lens optics and then you have uh, a piece of very non-optic uh, grade uh, acrylic that's curved and that is also at an angle. So um, that's a really good way to get lots of reflections and lots of distortion. So for mi reflection mitigation, uh, we use all of the methods, uh, lens hoods, which are commonly used. We have uh, custom 3D printed lens hoods. We have uh, a, a matte felt on the glare shield. So uh, what's the equivalent to the top of the dashboard in a car? And you can see in the top left that significantly cuts down on the amount of reflection that we see in the frame. And then the other thing we do is a polarizing filter on the lens. Again, nothing too groundbreaking, something photographers will be familiar with, but if we uh, polarize the incoming light, then all of the uh, polarized light coming off of the glare shield is going to be cut out and you'll see how big of a change that makes there. Uh, 
we do use fixed focus cameras. Uh, that is a standard technique of using uh, uh, MTF or modulation transfer function maximization, basically making the, uh, it's a computer vision algorithm that basically says, can we get the image as sharp as possible uh, and basically get the highest frequency uh, edges we can. And then uh, we focus at the hyperfocal distance. So that's the closest distance we can focus the camera such that everything past there to infinity is an acceptable focus. Um, and that's because we have such a wide range of wanting things in focus between uh, you know, things that are on the runway only a few meters away to things that are six, eight kilometers away. And finally, uh, the windshield introduces significant distortion. The lens itself has some uh, distortion as well. And so in order to uh, compute that distortion matrix, we perform an intrinsic uh, calibration by holding checkerboards up in, in front of the camera, as you can see an image of us running one of those uh, calibrations there. And then the visualization on the right shows the distribution of checkerboards that we cover across the field of view. All right, and then finally, we have a onboard system monitoring control system. Uh, this is the human machine interface, HMI. Uh, it's a React web app running on an iPad that we mount uh, on the right side of the instrument panel of the aircraft. That allows the flight test engineer to monitor and control the system. You can see uh, here uh, we are flying an approach to a runway and actually we do have the real-time inference system running. Uh, so this is using deep learning to find the runway uh, and draw the outline. And this is a, a very early version of, of this algorithm. So you'll see there's some glitchiness and, and that's the, the piece that we're working on. Okay, so let's talk about data labeling. Uh, in synthetic uh, data generation, labeling is a slightly more straightforward thing to do. Um, but in, in the real world, right, the, the INS is not perfect. The camera mount currently is mounted away from the INS itself. And so there's sort of a, a flexibility factor in, in both the aircraft frame and in the mount. So the translation is very precisely laser surveyed, but the relative rotation is not precise enough for accurate geometric projection. Um, it turns out that uh, a pixel of label offset corresponds to about a hundredth of a degree. And as you can imagine, it's relatively difficult to rigidly mount these two things that are far away from each other uh, to a hundredth of a degree accuracy, and then to measure the offset to a hundredth of a degree accuracy. So during the labeling process, we actually use an optimization method to refine that. So quickly, uh, what we do is we select the representative images across the landing, as you can see in the image, we have a human manually go in and label the runway corners. And then we are also able to do the projected labels. Uh, and you can see the re red and green labels overlaid on, on that image. Uh, and then we use an optimizer to basically say, all right, let's rotate the camera orientation such that we get the best match between what the human labels are and what the projected labels are. And then we use that optimized extrinsic calibration to label uh, everything using geometric projection. Now, this isn't perfect, right? Because it means we're using one extrinsic and if there's vibration of the camera mount or anything like that, then the labels get off. So we also use uh, different methods like traditional CV feature tracking and template matching. This is similar to if you're in a, a nonlinear editor for video or whatever, and you can track you know, any object uh, over time. It's a similar technique, but we get better performance than that. We get uh, uh, more tight tracking and less drift. Uh, by aggressive use of scale orientation and perspective normalization. And so here we can get the runway region of interest, the rough region of interest from the geometric projection. We have a planarity assumption. So runways are generally fairly flat. And what you can do then is you can perspective warp the image to sort of move the camera around. And you'll note that you know the buildings and everything sort of warp in unrealistic ways, but luckily that flat plane of the runway generally tends to look okay. We do key points, uh, key point detection in the normalized image. We compute correspondences to a previously labeled template image, use standard CV techniques like RANSAC to compute the homography, which is basically a mapping of that 3D perspective from one image to the other. And because we already have labels for this source image, we're able to sort of translate those labels into the destination image. 
And uh, this sort of ima uh, image at the bottom here shows that this CV technique surprisingly works even at very long distances in very low visibility. Um, you might barely be able to make out the, the runway in that image. And certainly that might be a difficult one to label by hand. Uh, but the, the, this uh, computer vision technique actually is, is fairly robust for, for doing this labeling. And so what we actually do is we take geometric projection, we take these computer vision techniques, um, as well as a couple other things, and we fuse all those labels together to say, here is the canonical label that is the best we can get it, and that's what we feed to the deep learning team. And so here's just uh, um, sort of a shot of a very small slice of the data set uh, from the daytime uh, visual conditions data collection uh, that we've delivered to the ML uh, team for model development and training. We have equivalent data sets for nighttime. We're just now collecting a lot of other data for more challenging conditions like backlit conditions or uh, flying through clouds and other things like that. All right, and I think that's the end of that and uh, be happy to take questions. Thank you, Harvest, and thank you, Anastasio, for this really interesting talk. Um, well, if anyone ever told me um, that you could train a, like a real-world plane, a flight simulation, or not a flight, but a flight system with image images generated from the same tools that we've been using to create animated movies or visual effects movies, I would have never believed that. And I think that's a really, really interesting. So one little question that I have for you both is the goal of these two different pipelines is to feed a deep CNN model, right? And I want to know like, what is the state of um, the, that, that model in terms of, of, of like real flights is, is the work getting into some like early R&D phase or is it something that's already applied to some flight systems? Is it, where does this work go in regarding to, to, the, to, the, to Airbus and, and the industry? Yeah, I, can, I can speak to that. So um, this, is, this is relatively early on in the R&D phase, um, you know, one of the things that people will hear is, hey, don't most airplanes already fly themselves? Uh, and there is some grain of truth to that. that it turns out that uh, most commercial aircraft are capable of doing things like fully autonomous auto land. Um, but when you do that, right, you need the ground-based instrument systems, radio-based instruments that basically help the aircraft know where it is relative to the runway. Uh, and of the thousands of airports that commercial aircraft fly into, only you know less than a hundred will have the system that lets you land on the system all the way to the ground. So uh, the goal here is basically um, we talk a lot about detecting the runway. We talk a lot about getting our relative position to the runway. Well. If we can do that reliably, then the rest of the flight dynamics and the path planning and the trajectories and all that and the flight controls to get the aircraft you know, from the approach onto the ground, that's another problem that's relatively better solved. But the idea of being able to really precisely determine your position using computer vision relative to the runway is the one that we're pushing on. And, uh, it, it's not going to be, um, you know, immediate entry into market because this is still something that we're working a lot on. But uh, mm -hmm. but it it seems promising. And the other piece of that is, you know, we say this this is uh, um, is feeding is is used to train machine learning models. Well, um, it it's not for now at least quite so simple as you know you have the images you have a big black box uh, deep neural net and then you get out the exact answer you want right like that that would be a nice thing to get to maybe but uh, currently what it is is we have a number of uh, uh, neural networks that do a very specific thing and what we do is we have neural networks, we have traditional computer vision algorithms, we have other types of algorithms, pre and post processing, and we assemble that all into, you know, uh, uh, sort of a graph. Again, VFX pipeline people will be very familiar with having this graph of processing the input and turning into output, where the machine learning uh, pieces are actually nodes in that graph. Yeah, I, I, I would add to that that autonomous flying is a big 
concept. Is it, you, you can put a lot of in, in, inside autonomous flying, and we are researching in some some aspect of this, what it means to be autonomous flying, and this has many many implications because another uh, another functionality that we can add to this when we have these neural networks, we can also train neural networks, for example, to detect uh, airplanes, right? And in terms of uh, you, you are flying and you you fly in, you have been flying flying in a small aircraft you will see that it's actually very difficult to detect all the to see all the aircrafts uh, flying around you so that could be another application of this is to to help the pilot actually to to detect other aircrafts or even to use uh, ai to to help the pilot to make better decisions or, or to assess risk okay rc uh thank you very much for these explanations we are um, running uh, short of time. Um, I have one last question that I'm going to ask uh, Dasio. Uh, I think it's going to interest our crowd is like, what are the, the differences in, in you, coming from the visual effects animation industry, you've used a lot of tools that you were using now. Like, what is it that you're using from the aircraft industry right now in terms of simulation and all that? Um, how different is it to the, to the set of tools that you've had before? The, the, the tools are surprisingly similar. I mean, we, we can use Houdini to do some work. We can use Maya to do other work. We can use real-time training techniques like the flight simulator. We are actually using Unreal Engine now, or we are starting to use Unreal Engine. So the tools are, are pretty similar. What is what is different for us is, is some of them math, for example, because we cannot assume a flat world anymore. So we, we work in 3D environments, but everything has to have a proper reference frame. And we have to take into account the, the, the radius of the Earth, for example, on the curvature. So the, the, the tools are, are the same. It's that sometimes, sometimes we need to adapt these tools to take in, into account the, the real world that we're trying to mimic. And, and, and there are some limitations, for example. Uh, there are some limitations in, in Maya or Houdini. Uh, if we're going to dip down in terms of uh, technical aspects, you can get along with using flat numbers. Um, and for us, for some computation, we actually use, need to use double numbers because of, of the precision that is required. But, but, but in terms of the tool set, it is, is very similar. Well, one of the things that we don't use, for example, is uh, offline renderings, like a render man, things like that. We we don't use those. But at least not 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 not, the, not yet, not now. <laughs> not now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we're um, short of time, and the other session has already started. And there are some really good questions from the public. Um, so we have created a forum in Hoover. And uh, Harvest and Anastasio will be able to answer all the questions uh, later on in the forum. So um, I'm going to wrap up this session. I really wanted to say thank you again to Harvest and Anastasio for this wonderful talk. And uh, I invite all of you to join the next session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alexei. Bye. Thank you.